Hey guys, I'm Eric at AeroGuard Flight Training Center and today we are going to talk a little bit about private pilot privileges and limitations. This is something that I've had requested a couple of times now from some of our current students and so I thought we would kind of dive in and uh, talk about how this works. What I'm going to do for the purposes of, of this conversation is kind of divide up uh, privileges and limitations for, for us as a pilot into three categories, right? So I'm going to more or less make this kind of like a flow chart. And if we got an, an, an example uh, of like a scenario of can you do this flight, uh, I think that there's sort of three basic criteria that we'll ask ourselves about uh, to determine if we have uh, the, the capability as, a, as the pilots to do this flight. So one is uh, the aircraft, the second is what we'll call currency, and the last one is the operation itself. Uh, so what we're going to do in this video is kind of take a deeper dive into each of these and figure out exactly uh, what our privileges and limitations are as a private pilot. First up is the aircraft. Right, so jumping into that, I, I want to kind of divide that into two different groupings. First, we're going to talk a little bit about aircraft category, class, and type, uh, and then we'll talk about kind of some of the special endorsement pieces as well. So starting off with the aircraft category, class, and type, why I think this is so important is because uh, ultimately when we receive our private pilot certificate, uh, we get this little green card, and on the front it just says private pilot, right? That's all it says. Uh, and so what's important is when we turn it over and we look at the back of that card, uh, we will identify what particular category and class aircraft, along with any type ratings we might have, we have uh, associated with that uh, certificate, which means which aircraft we're allowed to operate. So. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on the airplane category, so we'll say uh, any airplane, uh, and then there's four classes of airplanes, so I've just abbreviated them here. We have single engine land, multi-engine land, single engine C, and multi-engine C. So uh, there are obviously other categories of aircraft, for example, rotorcraft is another category of aircraft, uh, of which it has two classes, and, and so on. Um, for our purposes, I think this is sufficient. It is important to point out that just because we can fly single engine land does not mean we could fly a multi-engine airplane or uh, a seaplane. So the last bit of that is a type rating. Uh, and so sometimes we get a little bit confused about this. Uh, we mistake type for what some might refer to as make and model of aircraft. And Type is different just because it has a very specific meaning, uh, especially with the FAA. A type rating means that you're going to receive a specific authorization on the back of that pilot certificate to operate a certain uh, type of aircraft. Generally type is a make and a model, but not all aircraft need a type rating. Specifically, there's three requirements that the FAA puts in place. Either it's considered a large aircraft, which means it has a takeoff weight greater than 12,500 pounds, or if it's turbojet or turbofan powered, uh, or if the FAA has deemed it to need a, a, a type rating. Uh, but outside of those requirements, aircraft don't need necessarily a, a particular type rating. So, uh, as an example, let's say I got my private pilot's license here at AeroGuard. We fly Piper Archers as our single engine airplane. Uh, so now the question is, could I go after completing all of my training in the Piper Archer and then taking my check ride in the Piper Archer, could I go on and uh, rent a Cessna from a friend of mine or another flight school or something like this? Uh, so the answer to that is, in essence, yes, right? Because uh, if I rented, for example, a Cessna 172, it's, for all intents and purposes, identical to an Archer, right? It has all the same function. It is airplane, single engine land, no type rating required. Uh, so for, at least for the purposes of this, this first section, that's fine. This basically would say that I could fly any airplane, single engine land, that does not require a type rating. Now, 
uh, some of you might be thinking, well, there's, there's examples of that that's, that, I, that I can't do. That's accurate as well. So let's go now to uh, number two, the idea of special endorsements. Uh, so with special endorsements, this kind of comes from uh, the same regulation that talks about type ratings, which is 6131. Uh, and inside of there, beyond where it talks about type ratings, it talks about uh, different endorsements we might need from specialized training in order to fly certain kinds of aircraft. Uh, so it talks about complex airplanes, uh, which are those that have uh, flaps, retractable landing gear, and a constant speed propeller. Uh, high performance airplanes, which would be any airplane that has a, an engine that has greater than 200 horsepower. A tailwheel airplane, uh, which is obviously one that does not have a nose wheel, but instead a tailwheel. And then high altitude aircraft, which have service ceilings uh, or maximum altitudes uh, at or above 25,000 feet. Uh, so in those cases, I would need specialized training per the, the regulations and a specific endorsement in order to uh, be able to operate those aircraft. So as an example, let's take another uh, Piper aircraft. So the Piper M600, for example. Uh, the Piper M600 uh, is a turboprop airplane. Uh, that has retractable landing gear and a controllable pitch propeller, so technically it meets a few of these requirements, right? It, it's a complex airplane, uh, it's a high performance airplane, and I believe its service ceiling is above 25,000 feet, in which case it probably is also a high altitude uh, airplane as well. In which case, even though the Piper M600 is airplane single engine land, uh, I would have to have these special endorsements in order to uh, be able to, to fly it. Whereas, for example, a Cessna 172 is just airplane single engine land, doesn't necessarily have any of these other requirements to meet, and therefore, uh, without these special endorsements, I would still be able to fly it. Okay, let's jump over now to our next topic, which is going to be currency. Okay, so next up is currency. And what I want to focus on here are two particular regulations. One is 6156, which talks about a flight review, and the other is a regulation 61.57, which talks about recent flight experience or recency of flight. So with the flight review, this just identifies uh, whether we are eligible to, to exercise our privileges as a pilot in command. Uh, this really applies to all pilots, but absolutely still applies to private pilots. Uh, it just identifies that every 24 calendar months or every two years, we need to uh, be sort of checked. Either we can do that through a check ride for another rating or, or pilot certificate, uh, or we can do that with a flight instructor, uh, in which case the, the flight review process is a minimum of one hour of ground and, and one hour of flying. Uh, now, in addition to that, we have another rule, the 6157, the recent flight experience, which talks more specifically not just about being pilot in command, but for operations where we are going to carry passengers. So in this case, in order to carry passengers, not only would we need to meet the requirements of this flight review, but we would also need to have uh, three takeoffs and three landings in the last 90 days in the same category, class, and type aircraft if, if, if required. Uh, so if we were going to fly uh, in a single engine airplane, that means in the last 90 days, we need three takeoffs, three landings in the, in the same airplane, single engine land uh, category and class. Um, there are some additional parameters for this regulation that talk about uh, this idea of what we call night currency. Um, which is if you're going to carry passengers when it's dark, make sure these three takeoffs and landings happen when it's dark. It all basically jives with uh, pretty common sense stuff, right? Uh, in addition to the, the legal requirement, I think that the other idea of recency of flight may just come down to how good you feel, how comfortable you feel exercising your privileges. If you haven't flown in quite a while, and if you haven't flown in that, 
kind of airplane, maybe it's a make and model that you haven't flown in a long time, maybe it's wise for you to, to go up with another uh, pilot who is familiar, or maybe for you to get up and at least practice a few takeoffs and landings before you, uh, you go out on the uh, entirety of a flight maybe with passengers. Either way, uh, these are the sort of legal requirements and then obviously you should have your own uh, kind of checks and balances in place to make sure you don't put yourself in a, in a situation where you feel uh, unsafe. All right, that's currency. Now we'll jump over to the operations side and uh, talk a little bit about the requirements there. So now let's jump into the last bit, which is the operation itself, what we're actually doing on the flight. Uh, this will kind of solidify our, our, our operations as far as being within limitations or outside of our uh, uh, privileges. So to start with, we're going to ask a, a question. And I've kind of made this crazy flow chart, and we're going to walk through each of these steps. So the first question is, are you paying uh, your pro rata share as, as the regulation uh, 61.113 talks about? And so uh, if the answer is, is yes, you're paying for your portion. So if it's you and a friend of yours on the flight, you're paying for at least half of the operating expenses, uh, then great, you can pretty much move along and that is fine. If the answer to that question is no, uh, then we kind of have a sub question to ask, right, which is, uh, does this particular flight fall under one of the exceptions? Right, so uh, I've sort of listed out six different uh, kind of exceptions to this rule. Um, so <clears throat> the first one is flight is incidental to the business and you're not carrying persons or property for hire. Uh, so that is, is one example if, for example, you are, uh, Let's say you're a realtor and you fly for fun on the side uh, and you need to fly yourself in your airplane to some place to meet with a potential customer or client or whatever. Uh, that could theoretically fall under a similar category as this. Uh, number two, operating for charity or nonprofit event. So this is more uh, kind of articulated in a regulation 91.146. Uh, basically, there's community events or uh, nonprofit events that, that are you're authorized to, to fly the airplane and you don't have to pay your portion uh, of, of the operating expenses. The nonprofit or charity organization can do that uh, and then you're just using your private pilot services. Uh, the third is conducting approved search and location operations. So once again, by approved, they just mean that this is either uh, a government agency or some approved organization um, that is sort of requesting or uh, asking for your help in, in conducting these flights. Uh, number four is acting as an aircraft salesperson. So if you uh, sell an airplane, let's say you work for Piper or Cessna or Beechcraft or Mooney or one of these organizations and you're selling uh, an, an airplane, you can give kind of demo rides, that's fine. Uh, obviously you're not going to pay for the operating expenses of, of that particular flight, but there is sort of a caveat. In order for you to do those flights, uh, you have to have a minimum of 200 hours of total time. Uh, the fifth one is <clears throat> kind of in a similar vein. So towing gliders or ultralights. So if a, a glider needs to be towed into the air, uh, you can often do that uh, so long as you meet, once again, some of the particular requirements uh, that are listed in 61.69. And most of that is just that you have some particular experience and you have a certain amount of uh, aeronautical experience in, in airplanes as well. Um, and then the sixth one here is acting as a safety pilot. So this is discussed in a regulation 91.109. And so if uh, you have a friend that wants to fly uh, in like simulated instrument conditions, you know, under the hood or something like this, they need a safety pilot with them. If you're rated to be in that aircraft, uh, then you can absolutely act in that capacity. And once again, you don't necessarily have to pay uh, your portion of the, that flight if uh, you work that out with the other person. Uh, one thing that I will highlight is the list of exceptions that I've talked about here are pretty specific to airplane operations. There may be additional uh, exceptions for other categories of aircraft, uh, 
Uh, but I'm kind of sticking specifically to uh, airplanes for the sake of making this a little bit simpler. Um, good, so we go back to the question, does the flight fall under one of those exceptions? If it does, great, then we can move on, just like if we were paying our pro rate a share. If it does not fall under one of those exceptions, uh, then we have a problem, right? Uh, the problem is, is that we are then not uh, operating within the, the privileges and the limitations of our private pilot certificate, so we would come down here to this outside of our privileges or outside of uh, the tolerances for our certificate. If we did sort of pass these checks, uh, the next question is about maintenance. And so this is a little bit interesting. Uh, this is referring to uh, maintenance for our aircraft and, and specifically what it's getting toward to is, is as private pilots we are authorized to do what's known as preventive maintenance, right? Uh, and what that means is really simplistic routine tasks that aren't complicated in the least. You can sort of equate this to like doing work on your own car, right? So you can change your own oil uh, relatively easily. Uh, those, those types of things can fall under the category of preventive maintenance. There is a few other caveats to what is described as preventive maintenance, right? So uh, we can find kind of a list of these things in Part 43 of the Federal Aviation Regulations in Appendix Alpha. And in there, it talks a little bit about, uh, it actually gives us a list and um, it, it says that it can involve uh, complex uh, interactions, so that's fine. Um, but it, it talks a little bit more about this in Part 43 as well, where it says anytime any maintenance is done, whether it's preventative or uh, uh, or not, it must be documented in the logbook for the aircraft. So another big piece to this is, do you have access to those uh, maintenance logbooks for the aircraft, and are you able and willing to make an entry uh, of the work that you completed? Um, so that's sort of one of the, the, the pieces to this question. So if I ask, are you conducting maintenance on the aircraft? If the answer is no, good, easy, then don't worry about it. If the answer is yes, then we have to go to, is it like major or minor repairs or, or alterations, or is it preventive maintenance? Uh, if it falls under this category of uh, preventive maintenance, uh, are you able to, to ultimately make the the required documentation in the maintenance logbook. Uh, so if it is, and you can make all of the required documents uh, happen correctly, then good, you're within your limitations. Uh, if it's not preventive maintenance, uh, or you cannot uh, complete the required documentation, then it would fall outside of your privileges. Um, so once again, we kind of have this, uh, this whole flow chart deal. Hopefully uh, this makes sense to everybody. Um, so after this, we've, we've gone through now each of our three areas, right? We talked about the aircraft, whether we're approved to fly this aircraft, uh, the concept of currency, uh, and then the operation itself. And in this particular instance, uh, I think we've, we've basically covered all of the yes and no pieces to our privileges and limitations as a private pilot. Uh, and I think, uh, hopefully, if you do have any other additional questions, leave them in the comments below, and I'm sure we can uh, get them answered for you. Uh, excellent. So hopefully this was very helpful. Uh, once again, my name is Eric with AeroGuard Flight Training Center, and we'll see you at the next video. Thanks.